chapter 10, the gospel of Mark, and chapter number 10. I'd like to remind everyone that we'll be taking of the Lord's Supper tonight at the end of the evening service, so you'll not want to miss that uh, in our 6 o'clock service tonight. If you have your place with me in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 10, I'd like to draw your attention to verse number 23, Mark 10, verse 23, and we'll begin reading there. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. I'd like for you to read with me the last words of verse 27, if you have a red letter Bible, uh, read with me the words of Christ in verse 27. Ready? With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Again, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Are you depending your life upon that? Would you trust your eternity to that? Would you trust your neighbor's eternity to that? That with men it is impossible not with God, for with God all things are possible. I want to preach this morning, I just titled the message, The God of the Impossible, is what I'd like to focus on this morning. Our Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your word and thank you for this great truth that you have instilled upon us this morning. When it comes to any affairs of life, life temporal or life eternal, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Help us, dear Lord, today believe that. Dear Lord, help us to understand why we can believe that. And why we can have total trust, total confidence in you, Lord, as the God of the impossible. And we just pray you'll speak to hearts now according to thy will in Jesus' name. Amen. In the preceding verses, of this text that I just read to you, the Lord Jesus has just dealt with a young man 
who ran up to him and asked him what he would have to do in order to inherit eternal life. He was a rich young man. And his story is contained in verses 17 to 22. And I'm not interested in preaching about him, but let me just say a couple of things about this young man that prompted the Lord to say what he did say in the text that we read, beginning in, beginning in verse 23. When we consider this young man here, uh, we consider the fact that he had a pretty remarkable life. This wasn't just uh, any run-of-the-mill young man. This was uh, quite a remarkable young man. Uh, he comes to Jesus and uh, he wants to know, Good Master, uh, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? as if it could be purchased at some price or if it could be uh, bought by some labor or some work. And uh, Jesus uh, looked at him and said, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, that is God. And Jesus uh, reviewed a thing or two with him about the commandments. He said, You, you know the commandments. Uh, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, uh, don't bear false witness, you know, don't lie, uh, don't defraud one another, be honest, honor your father and your mother. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this young man answered the Lord and said, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. This was a great guy. This was probably a guy that, that you would want to be associated with, perhaps to be to be friends with. He uh, had a pretty remarkable life uh, to be a young man as he was and to gain uh, the wealth that he had gained at this young age. But not only do we observe this young man's remarkable life, but we also see that uh, this young man had a wonderful opportunity in front of him. And so in, in his discussions with the Lord, uh, he thought that he's given the Lord the answers that the Lord wanted to hear. Perhaps he was on his way to eternal life. And so the Lord responded to him in verse number uh, 21. And uh, he said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and take up the cross, and follow me. Now this is not promoting a work salvation, that if you go sell all your worldly goods, uh, that, that you'll get uh, salvation. That's not what the Lord's talking about. He's trying to explain to this young man that he needed a change in priority that he could not count on his bags of gold. And he says, uh, that's what you're trusting in. That's fine and that's good that you're rich and uh, that you have much goods. You've worked hard. You've earned what you have received. Uh, uh, you didn't have it handed to you. You went out and you labored and you worked for it. Uh, but all of your labor and all of your work and all of your religion in keeping the law will not get you into heaven. You need a change of priority. You need to come to realize that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven and uh, He's the truth and the life and no man cometh to the Father but by Him. So the Lord Jesus Himself gave this young man a wonderful opportunity to change his life by coming to Christ by faith and remove his faith in his riches and place his faith in Jesus Christ. So we not only see this young man's remarkable life and his wonderful opportunity, but in verse number 22 we see his devastating choice. 
his devastating choice. When faced with the choice, do I trust in my riches or do I trust in Christ? And in verse 22, he made his decision. And he was sad at that saying. And went away grieved, for he had great possessions. How great it would have been had the verse been turned just a bit and said that he went away glad and was rejoicing because he gave his heart to Christ. But that's not what it says. He went away sad and grieved. He rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So he walks off into a Christless remainder of his life and unless something happened later on in his life before he died, he went out into a Christless eternity as far as we know. And the Lord looked at his disciples how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished at his words. And, and Jesus gave them a little illustration of how difficult, how might near impossible it would be for one who is trusting in riches. Nowhere... In this text, does Jesus say that you can't go to heaven if you're rich? He makes it very plain here in verse number 24 that he's speaking of those who trust in riches. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now there's much debate between Bible scholars, theologians, people far smarter than I, as to what exactly Jesus meant when he said that. There is the school of thought that Jesus was referring to the inner door of the door of the gate into the city which was used for humans to pass through so that the entire gate did not have to be opened and in order for a camel to go through that little doorway it would have to get down on its knees all of its load, its burden would have to be unloaded and then it would squeeze through there and then on the other side load all of the burden back up Get the camel back up and go your way. Uh, then there's another school of thought that he was speaking of a literal needle. Uh, there were other cultures of that day who used this illustration and said, spoke about an elephant going through the eye of a needle. I'm not going to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel on this situation. We'll just simply suffice to say that the Lord said it's extremely difficult, it's might near impossible for one who trusts in riches to go to heaven. So then the disciples asked this question. Well, who then can be saved? And Jesus said plainly, with men, it is impossible. Man cannot save himself. That's the great lesson we learn in verses 26 and 27. Uh, that man, it, it is impossible that man can save his own soul. Strong's uh, concordance says the word impossible here means that which is unable to be done. It is what the law could not do. I love to read Noah Webster's 
1828 uh, edition of the Dictionary of the American Language. It is so much more in-depth than the ones we have today. Mr. Webster said that impossible uh, speaks of a physical impossibility. And physical impossibilities are those things which are contrary to nature. And moral impossibilities are those things that just cannot be. Those things which lie beyond the realm of possibility. But when we consider the whole realm of creation and the entire realm of our own existence, there are many things that we have to deal with that are impossible. We deal with lots of impossibilities personally. Just make a list for yourself. You'll be surprised at what is impossible for you to do alone. We really are sheep. We really are incompetent in so many areas that we are literally unable to make it through a single day in our own strength, in our own intelligence, and in our own conscience, or our own cunning. It's impossible. The Lord said in the Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, in verse 45, that it is even impossible for us to even exist for even one day. He said in Matthew 5, 45, For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Consider the words of the Lord Jesus in that verse. Without His Son, we don't exist. If the Son were extinguished today, we'd be dead tomorrow. We must have the Son to live. And God provides that. Without God, no Son. He talks about water. He says he sends the rain. Man cannot live without water, not very long. Uh, depending on the mass of your body, uh, it's just a matter of a few days. Your organs will start shutting down as your body dehydrates and your body will cease to function. The majority of your body right now is water. But no God, no water. No God, no sun. And then what about the air that we breathe? Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse number 5, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. We live in a world of impossibilities as far as our condition is concerned. But the Bible says, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. So in every circumstance, every event, every affair of our day-to-day -day existence, there is a God in heaven who is able, who is worthy, and can be trusted to handle every impossibility in our life. The Apostle Paul spoke of our wonderful Lord and Savior to the men of Athens after scolding them for ignorantly worshiping an unknown God, he said in Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwell, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, 
neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. For in him we live and move and have our being. Now I want you to consider for just a moment what are some things in your life right now that you would love to see accomplished, that you would love to see come to pass. Or perhaps there's some things in your life that you would give anything if they would go away or that you could get relief from them. But the fact of the matter is, whether it's something you desire or something you despise, in your own intelligence, in your own strength, in your own cunning, it is beyond the realm of possibility that it's ever going to happen. Are you thinking? Do you have it? It's impossible. So why are you even preaching it? Impossible. Preacher, why are you even preaching it? If it is impossible, because my Bible says that it is only impossible with men, but not with God. For with God all things are possible. Now let me share with you where the Lord led me. And let me give you a couple of reasons from the Bible why God is the God of the impossible. And that thing that's on your mind right now that you have determined in your finite way of thinking that it's impossible for this to happen or for this to go away, but not with God. Because with God, all things are possible. Number one, all things are possible with God because God is the creator of all things. How can the one who created everything that was, is, or ever shall be, how can anything ever be impossible with the creator of all things? That in itself is impossible. Now Paul told the believers in the church of Colossae in the book of Colossians chapter 1, if you'd like to turn with me there, Colossians chapter 1 and beginning in verse number 15. I want to read a few verses and I want to make a couple of observations and then we'll move on. But now this ought to give you some hope. This ought to give you some encouragement about the impossible things of your life that yes, with you, yes, with men, it's impossible. But we're not going to focus on the impossible. We're going to focus on the possible. And nothing is impossible for God. You have your place in Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Now that's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's defining here who Paul is addressing the Lord Jesus Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1 teaches us that lesson as well. Now we also see that this is the Lord Jesus. For by Him were all things created. Your Bible say that. For by Him, by the Lord Jesus were all things created. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3, tells us that very truth, that He is the creator of all things, and there's nothing that was made that He didn't make. Now, 
not only did he create the things that are here, but it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven now look up here I want you to understand something we're talking about the God of the impossible and I just made a statement that our God is the God of the impossible because he is the creator of all things nothing is impossible for the creator of all things he is the creator you are here this morning this church is here this property is here because Jesus Christ created it and willed it to be here And I'm just glad to be a part of it. But he said that not only were all things created by him, but it says by him all things consist. That means that not only is he the creator, he is also the sustainer. Not only did he create us from the dust of the ground, but he sustains us day by day. I got up this morning, not in my strength, not in my power. I got up because I have a God who sustains his creation. And so not only is God our creator, he's our sustainer. But then notice at the end of the verse he says, in the last verse of, the, of that text, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. He is our creator, he is our sustainer, and he is our reconciler. And that word reconcile means to draw back to himself. Now, what, what, what is all of that? Let's put some wheels on that theory. Let's put some legs on that. Uh, let's operationalize that so that I can use it. All right, here you go. The Lord Jesus created you. You can say amen to that. But do you know what He also created? He also created your impossibilities. He created your problems that you have. Whoa, back up the bus. God created my problems. My Bible just told me that He's the creator of all things. And by Him all things consist. And He reconciles all things to Himself. When the disciples went across the Sea of Galilee and that storm of wind came up. God caused that storm. They weren't in that storm because they were out of the will of God or because they were rebellious or because God was punishing them for something. No, God had something great that He wanted them to learn. And my friend, through our problems and through our impossibilities, God has lessons for us to learn from that, that we may grow thereby in wisdom and in stature and become more and more like the Lord Jesus. But not only did He create you, 
He created your problems and your impossibilities, but watch this. Not only did He create those two things, but He also created the solution that He already has worked out. Just hadn't let you in on it yet. But it's already there. That thing you're thinking of that's impossible, it's possible. And God already has it works out, worked out. But hey, what are you going to trust? Are you going to trust your own intellect? Or are you going to trust God? God gives us the same choice He gave to the rich young man. You trust in your riches or are you trust in God? He chose to trust in His riches. So you have every right to walk out of the building today trusting in your own intellect, your own smartness, your own strength, and you're going to figure this out on your own. Help yourself. But just be reminded that my Bible says with men it is impossible. But not with God. With God all things are possible. So number one, our God is the God of the impossible because He's the creator of all things. Secondly, He's not only the creator of all things, but He's the power that moves all things. Did you know that in this vast universe that we live in, billions and billions of galaxies and stars and planets and things we've not even yet discovered, but in all of creation, there are only two things that exist. Number one is mass. That's, that's mass. This is mass. And the other thing is energy. And energy is what moves the mass. And according to the scriptures, the Lord Jesus is both. He is the mass. And He is the energy that moves the mass. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Listen. For there is no power but of God. There's no power that exists Anywhere that is not God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Nothing exists and nothing moves outside of the power of God. That is a God to whom nothing is impossible. He created all things and He moves all things. We, we, we could, I guess, very loosely just gather all of the energy in the universe and put it under an umbrella and call that umbrella providence. The providence of God. That thing that seems impossible to you, it is impossible to you, but to you only, not to God. For with God all things are possible. He's the creator of all things. He is the power that moves all things. But I want you to watch this lastly. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 3 and in verses 20 and 21, the Bible tells us that our God is the enabler of all things. He not only creates all things, and not only is He the power that moves all things, but He is the enabler 
that makes all things happen. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly. I want you to notice that little two word phrase. Exceeding abundantly. Abundantly is more than enough. But our God does exceeding abundantly above anything that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Watch this. You're sitting there thinking, I'm blowing smoke. I don't understand your situation. And I don't understand how impossible it is. And you know what? You are exactly right. And I don't have the answer. I don't know how to fix it. But I know one who does. And I have a God who not only created all things and empowers all things, but He enables all things to come to pass because He is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything we ask or think. That means His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That means that His ways are higher than our ways. That means that we are limited, but God is unlimited. And so this morning, as you bow your head and close your eyes, I hope that your mind is still on that impossible thing. And I would like to encourage you to trust God with it. That He can bring it to pass. Because He's the creator. He's the power. He's the enabler. And if you don't remember those three words, don't worry about it. Just remember Mark 10, 27. With God, all things. Father, thank you for your word this morning. And we ask now as we open these altars for a time of invitation that the congregation will respond to your word, not to me, but to your word. And I pray, dear Lord, they'll, embrace, they'll bring the impossible to you this morning and leave it with you and let you take care of it. For dear Lord, they have heard from the scriptures. With men it's impossible, but not with God. For with God all things. Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand our feet.